pray that your word would work towards that very end this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Consider this question. Is it possible? Is it possible to be on fire for Jesus, but cold toward his bride? Possible to be genuinely engaged with Christ, but disengaged from his people? Or is it possible to love the good shepherd, but be indifferent towards his flock? Well, that's a, a good question to bring to God's word this morning, isn't it? Let's do that by turning over to 1 John chapter 3. Let's bring that question, those questions to scripture, to 1 John chapter 3, specifically looking this morning at verses 11 through 24. Since this is a larger chunk of verses we won't be able to talk about everything. Not that we do talk about everything most of the time, but uh, I do see some key ideas here that I, I want to be able to hit on as we move through this text together this morning. You may remember that last time we talked about the fact that God cares about our spiritual health. God cares about our spiritual health, and he wants you, friend, brother, sister, he wants you to care about your spiritual health, to regularly care about your spiritual health. Therefore, it is important to regularly, to spiritually take your temperature as a Christian. How can you do that? Well, we can do that by using the word of God like a thermometer. That is allowing God's truth, allowing God's word to reveal unhealthiness in our life. As we talked about in that first lesson, as a way of grace, we've summarized this truth by defining four essential areas of belief. Areas of Christian belief that God would have us hold to and dig into and be fed by. But, but they also point us to indicators. They also provide for us indicators of spiritual healthiness when it comes to living out those beliefs. So we may hold to those beliefs intellectually, those four essentials, but God's word points us beyond just the mental assent, the mental agreement with those ideas. It calls us to actually live in light of the things that we say we believe. And when someone embraces these truths by faith, things begin to happen. The pattern of one's life begins to change. In the previous study, we considered the heart of what it means to be a servant of of one Lord. That is walking in light of the fact, walking in light of the fact that the Christian life is aimed at one target, to please Jesus Christ at all times and in every way. That is the heart of what it means to be a servant of one Lord. Now, in moving forward this morning, we are not moving on from that goal, we are simply going to build on that goal this morning. We are going to build on that idea. So let's listen to what John is communicating in this passage, what John, the Apostle John, is teaching, what he's communicating to those who consider themselves servants of one Lord. And if you consider yourself to be a servant of one Lord this morning, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, then... God is speaking to you through these words as well. Look with me, verses 11 through 15. John writes, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, 
who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. <laughs> we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now, clearly John was writing to a church in which some were being just downright mean, <laughs> cruel to one another, unkind to one another, radically unkind. At least these words seem to indicate that, don't they? Words like hate, murder, murdered, and murder point us in that direction. And when we think about what God might be communicating to us this morning in this passage, as you think about what he might be communicating to you this morning, we understand that all of us, of course, need to be reminded about the danger of hateful feelings, the danger of hurtful behavior, especially when those feelings and that behavior are found within our faith family. But I don't get the sense that our church is, is struggling in that way. So what I really hope you will take from this passage in terms of for yourself, yes, a warning against hateful feelings, har harmful behavior, but really looking at verse 14, there is a principle there that we need to hold on to. Look at that verse again, verse 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Do you see what John is telling us here? We have to skip a couple screens. Keep going. There we go. This is what John is telling us. Genuine life in Christ always leads to genuine love for Christ's people. Or to put it another way, love is a sign of new life from God. Love is a sign of new life from God, this kind of love, this brotherly love. So let's go back to that initial question from this morning. Is it possible to be on fire for Jesus, but cold toward his bride? Well, in light of verse 14, it would seem the answer to that question is ultimately no, it, it isn't possible. But that being said, that being said, I think all of us know that genuine Christians can and do struggle relationally within the church. And they do so for a variety of reasons. Some feel the way they do because they've been hurt by the church. They've been hurt by people within the church. Some are simply scared, nervous, cautious, over about getting too close, about letting others too close. And some within the church have just never heard solid teaching about what it means to belong to the body of Christ, about what it means to love one another as we hear in this passage. But others like many to whom John is writing, are intentionally or intentionally ignoring or minimizing or twisting, verse 11, that message that we heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Wherever you are this morning in regard to sincere brotherly love, there can be no doubt about the ideal toward which we either prayerfully process our feelings or that ideal toward which, in light of which, we repent. 
the ideal, the standard, the idea is clear here, brotherly love. But look at how John builds on this principle in verses 16 through 18 of 1 John 3. John declares, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So John is making it clear for his readers that when he writes about brotherly love in this chapter, this is what he means. This is exactly what he means. Notice the contrast John presents here between sacrificial service and lip service. Do you see that? Sacrificial service and lip service. Jesus Christ is and always must be our standard for love. Especially in how he exemplified love by offering up his own life for us, his very life on the cross. That radically sacrificial love is the very love that John is encouraging his readers to give to one another. That's what defines this love. That is the ideal of this brotherly love. Christ, it is Jesus-like love. It is Christ-like love. How do they give it to one another? How do they show love to one another, this kind of love? By, verse 17, opening their hearts to one another, not closing them, opening their hearts to one another, and doing so in light of genuine needs. What is it your brother or sister needs? How might you meet those needs? With an open heart. Here, the example is of someone who needs food and or clothing and or shelter. But we know these are just some important, but just some of the many needs that we can meet in love when it comes to our brothers and sisters in Christ. In most cases, these aren't the regular needs. They could be, but in many cases, there are other more regular needs that our brothers and sisters have. The need for your presence, your company, the need for a listening ear, a helping hand, an encouraging word, a, a timely note, a timely call. But please don't miss the contrast that we see here in verse 18. Look at verse 18. In the previous section, John mentioned those who murder with hate that hateful heart. But here we read about a far more subtle infection within the body of Christ. Verse 18, some might not practice hate, but still they only speak of love. You see that? There are those within the church who do not practice hate. They are not hate murderers, right? And of course, murder in this passage is not literal murder taking someone's life but it is a spiritual uh, that spirit the effects of spiritual hatred towards another well you may not be someone who does that and yet john says there are those who only speak of love within the church there's talk but no walk they proclaim good doctrine but will not live it out you and I may not be struggling with hate towards our brothers and sisters, but will our indifference and our inaction have the same effect within the church over the long run? John wants his readers to grapple with these questions, to grapple with this issue. But look at how that ugly reality points to the next section. An ugly reality of lip service 
And yet we hold on to that beautiful picture of brotherly love that we heard before. And as we do so, listen to how John continues in verse 19. Look with me at verse 19. By this, we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Did you hear John's heart coming through in those verses? Did you hear God's heart in those words? John wants them to take their temperature. As he's done throughout this section, he continues to speak here about signs of life, about spiritual healthiness, at times, all of us will deal with a condemning heart. Have you experienced that? I'm sure that you have. Maybe even this morning, you're battling with a condemning heart. That is not ultimately the issue in terms of what God communicates to us here. There's no need to feel bad about struggling with a condemning heart. It is a reality of our life in this world. That is not ultimately the issue. The issue is how we address, how we confront, how we wrestle with, how we operate on such a heart, a condemning heart. As verse 20 reminds us, we need to bring that condemning heart to God for God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. What does that mean practically? It means that when you are wrestling with a condemning heart, you need to turn to the word and prayer. Turn to the word and prayer. And when you use, use that thermometer of the word, you will be able to, to discern if you are truly unhealthy. Do you see that? Does that make sense? You see, some of us are condemned by our hearts because of past regrets, because of lingering shame. And when that is the case, when our heart is condemning us that, that we don't belong to God, that we are a failure, that, we've, uh, that no one could love us, uh, because that shame is so heavy on top of us. Uh, it is crushing us. We are without hope. We are feeling so desperate. When that is the case, the word actually becomes medicinal for us because it comforts us. It heals us with the grace and forgiveness that we have in Christ. But as is the em emphasis in this section, when our hearts are hateful, when our, our behavior is hurtful, when there is only indifference and inaction in regard to our faith family, in spite of our talk, no matter what we say, the word is confirming our unhealthiness. Do you see that? So our condemning hearts, the gospel can minister to it. But in some cases, that condemning heart is right on the money. We are feeling, experiencing that condemnation because we stand rightly condemned because of our behavior. We would call this conviction. 
We are convicted by our hearts. That's why John is describing for them what new life looks like, what it should look like. One Lord, one body. Servant, sibling. You can hear those same truths in verses 22 and 23. Look back at those again, starting at the end of verse 22. One Lord, one body. We keep his commandments and do what pleases him. Amen? And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, Jesus, the Messiah, and that we love one another just as he commanded us. All who truly belong to God the Father, brothers and sisters, all who truly belong to God the Father by his grace, through his son, through faith in his son, are brothers and sisters in one family. Whether you are experiencing that or not, whether you are stepping out in faith in light of that fact or not, uh, conform, letting your, your, the pattern of your life be conformed to that truth, that if you are a Christian, you are part of God's family, whether that's the case in your life or not in terms of your practice, it is irrevocably true. No matter what, if you belong to Christ, then you do belong to his family. You do have brothers and sisters in Christ. I think, though, that if we are honest about our modern world, honest about our own choices, honest about our own hearts, we will recognize, I believe, that the temptation today is not so much toward worldly hate instead of brotherly love. No, I think that temptation is more so a temptation to be consumers rather than siblings to be consumers rather than siblings. You see, the consumer simply attends a church out of want in order to get. The sibling is connected to the church by love in order to give. Let me say that again. The consumer simply attends a church out of want in order to get. The sibling is connected to the church by love in order to give. Please take a moment and think carefully about which one of those describes your relationship with the body of Christ, the faith family, the church of Jesus. Please take your temperature when it comes to to this one body that scripture calls the church. Now, obviously, a spiritual consumer doesn't think of himself or herself in those terms. That's not how they would characterize themselves. But whatever language you choose to use, God wants you to take your temperature even if you don't consider yourself a spiritual consumer in this way, he wants you to ask yourself, am I living in that way? The consumer simply attends a church out of want in order to get. That might, might sound hard, but in many cases, it's not necessarily, um, it's not necessarily so black and white. It's not necessarily, well, I just want this and then I'm out of here. I'm leaving. Some do that. Some come get something from the church and leave. Now, that may be a genuine need that that person has. And that's all they can really focus on. That's all they're focusing on right now is getting that need met. Uh, for others, the need that they want met, the thing that they want from the church is that sense of affirmation that they've done their duty. They've gone down the checklist. They've checked the boxes. They said, I've done this. I've gone to church. For many people being a consumer, it, it can look very different. But God wants us to take our temperature. Remember, being a spiritual consumer 
it may be different than you imagine. Such consumers are often not uninvolved. Yes, some may be sporadic in their attendance, but others are consistent, sometimes extremely consistent, often committed to coming. And consumers do give, right? In one way or another, they do give, but they give as consumers give, as any consumer gives. They give in order to pay for a product that will meet his or her needs. For any consumer, that is the priority. But the sibling, the sibling is first concerned with what pleases the father and then what blesses a brother or sister. Does that sibling have his or her own needs? Needs that need to be met? Of course they do. But they've learned that in most cases, they don't need to focus on their own needs to see that those needs are met. In fact, they've discovered that God is very often at work to meet their needs as they are focused on meeting the needs of brothers and sisters. As they are pouring themselves out for others within the body of Christ, they have discovered and learned that God is filling them up. Remember what we heard this morning. The man or woman who has truly passed out of death into life by God's grace is one who loves God's people. That kind of love, that brotherly love, is powerful evidence of God at work in a person's life. So it is love that motivates a sibling in God's family, as you would hope it would be love that motivates a sibling in any human family. It is love that motivates that brother, that sister. It's love that drives us to meet together regularly. Love that gives us courage to take down our walls. Love that compels us to reach out to the other. Love that prompts a prayer or inspires an encouraging word. Love that overcomes our fears or excuses or uncertainty or busyness or insecurities. Love that threads our lives together in a tapestry of fellowship. And that love is radically sacrificial, isn't it? It is Jesus-like love. It is self-emptying love. It goes above and beyond. It can inspire and inform our words, especially words filled with God's word. But this love is far bigger than just words. At least it should be. Is it possible to love the good shepherd, but be indifferent to his flock? Ultimately, no. But as we talked about earlier, is it possible for genuine Christians to struggle with lo loving other members of this one body, of this faith family? The answer, of course, is yes. <laughs> we see that all over the New Testament. We can all struggle. All of us do struggle. But if this new love that comes from new life is truly present within us, it will make that struggle purposeful. It will make that struggle purposeful. It will ultimately drive us forward in repentance and humility and a hunger to learn to grow, to step out, to connect, to persevere in that love? Is this simply a matter of willpower? No. We know how all of this is possible. Look again at the very last phrase of our passage this morning. How is this possible? Well, it's all by the Spirit whom he has given us. 
It's all by the Spirit whom he has given us. The Holy Spirit fuels the engine of this Jesus-like love for one another. The Holy Spirit is at work, as Paul said in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love. We know how all of this is possible, and we know why all of this is possible. John 3.16 may be the best-known verse in the Bible, but please don't miss, please don't forget 1 John 3.16. 1 John 3.16 says, By this we know love, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. The brothers and sisters of this faith family, brothers and sisters beyond our walls. Do you have that kind of relationship with God's people? Do you? Or are they merely people, like people in a grocery store? There's a lot of you there, but you're not really connected. There's a lot of people there, people who just happen to go to the same store. Are people within the church that for you, just other people who are going to the same spiritual provider as you are? If you are not connected in this way, then why not? If you are connected, how else might you give? How else might you love as a sibling in one body, as a servant of one Lord? Please take some time, even now, take some time to talk with God about your heart. Take your temperature in regard to struggles that you might be experiencing confusion that you might be dealing with, about reluctance, about the possible unhealthiness that may be active inside of you right now. Unhealthiness that for you is coloring that word 